the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. <coughs> Mrs. Roberts, call the roll, please. Mrs. Conrad Zangmeister. Here. Mr. Hoffman. Here. Mrs. Johns. Here. Mr. Smelter. Here. And Mr. Myers is homesick and is not here. All right. So that moves into minutes from last meeting. Hopefully everybody's had a chance to review those. If there's any questions, comments. Uh, if not, I need a motion to approve the minutes. So Move by Mr. Hoffman. Can I get a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Johns. Mrs. Roberts? Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mrs. Johns? Yes. <coughs> Mrs. Conrad Zangmeister? Yes. Mr. Smeltzer? Yes. Motion passes. Moves to 1.6, adjustments to the agenda. None at this time. Okay. Moves into number two, information discussion. 2.1, superintendent updates. Mr. Bilbo? Oh, I apologize a little bit in advance for the length of the updates, but a lot of things legislatively happening in Columbus, so I want to make sure to keep the board up to date. Uh, a few items from the agenda uh, have multiple contracts that we'll address tonight, some new hires, uh, unfortunately, uh, one retirement, uh, and we'll talk about that uh, shortly enough. Uh, but uh, just uh, as we get through and, we, and we're looking at contracts, especially if Coaches and volunteers who you know, help with so many things after school and and uh, really help our kids grow, in a, you know, all the way around the students. I just want to thank them for the time, effort, and energy that they put into their jobs uh, and uh, the impact that they have on students' lives. So uh, always uh, thankful for our coaches and volunteers and uh, you know, advisors for various groups. Uh, they put in a lot of time, so we're appreciative. Also excited uh, later in the board agenda uh, to have the board consider the revision of our vision and mission statements. Uh, I think uh, uh, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from uh, staff members, students, uh, community members, so I think it's a, a positive move and uh, we'll look to get those incorporated into our handbooks for next school year. Uh, but the uh, main, main part of my updates tonight are legislative type of updates. Um, Next week, I will uh, meet with uh, the county superintendents. We're going to Columbus to meet with Representative Loray, and uh, that will happen on the 25th, and then the 27th at the Bremer, Bremen Chamber meeting. Uh, Senator Schaefer will be there, so I have a chance to meet with him as well that day. So uh, trying to stay in contact with our representatives and, and advocate on behalf of the district. Uh, but a few things that I just want to make sure the board's aware of. First. All, all of this generally is, revolves around money. At the end of the day, most, most things do. Um, and when we look at our state right now, when you look at uh, actual revenues, actual tax revenues, this is all tax revenue in the state, we're currently running at a surplus of $804 million above projected revenues. Uh, the projected revenues were revised before the year started because of how well we did as a state last year in tax collections. So this is even higher than what they thought originally two years ago would be collected. All told, uh, at the end of the current budget cycle, so every two years the budget cycle, the state will be running at a surplus of $6 billion. That is after the state has transferred over $700 million into the rainy day fund that currently sets at $3.5 billion. Uh, it's also important to remember during the entire COVID pandemic, the state of Ohio never touched the rainy day fund. Uh, so there, there's this large pool of money there that uh, really has not been allocated for any purposes. And as we go through this budget cycle, a lot of people have a lot of plans for that money. So kind of keep that in the back of your head that we're running over $800 million surplus just this year alone, a $6 billion surplus estimated at the end of June in the budget altogether. So 
As we start going down through some of this stuff, just keep those numbers in mind. <coughs> First up, House Bill 33, which is the budget bill. Uh, the, the big impact for schools is the fair school funding plan. Uh, we will be going into years three and four in the implementation of the fair school funding plan. It was, when, when the fair school funding plan was developed, uh, the legislature decided to partially phase in the total amount of money that would take to fully fund public education in Ohio. The proposed budget in House Bill 33 would take us from 33% of that fair school funding plan, that's what we're currently funded at, if it, whatever the whole pot of money it would take to fully fund public schools, right now the state has given us 33% of that. And schools just make it work. They're proposing to increase that from 33 to 50%, which is an increase of $159 million. If they wanted to take it to 100% next year, they could do that out of the surplus alone. It, without making a dent into the fiscal budget, they could just pay for it out of the surplus. In 2025, it's proposed to go from 50% to 66.7%, which would be another increase of $274 million. Uh, one of the things to remember, though, and this is, this is a key piece, they are still using base inputs from 2018 to figure out what it would take to fund schools. And what I mean by base inputs is they took the average, for example, the average teacher salary from 2018, and that's the number they're using to determine this formula to fund schools. Well, we have the numbers for 2022, but they do not want to use those numbers because, again, it would mean more money that would be needed for public schools. Uh, so in the budget, they're looking at 2018 inputs, 50% of the total funds needed in year one, 66.7 of the total funds needed in year two. Superintendents across the state, VASA, are A, advocating just fund it fully. The money's there, fund it fully, but then also use current inputs. Use 2022 numbers. Uh, I, I don't think we'll get that. It's what we're asking for. Uh, but uh, I, I think at the end of the day, what is proposed in the governor's budget will probably be pretty close to what gets passed. Uh, just, just my gut feeling. Also in House Bill 33, uh, our vouchers are addressed in three different ways. Um, the governor's budget, which is House Bill 33, the House has its own version of vouchers, and then the Senate has their version of vouchers. So there are three separate bills pending that address vouchers uh, to go to non-chartered uh, schools, private schools, so on and so forth. In the governor's budget, the governor is proposing to raise uh, those eligible for vouchers up to 400% of the federal poverty level. What that means is approximately 80% of Ohio families would be eligible for vouchers if they moved that poverty line up to 400%. Um, and, and what they're looking at is a family of four could make up to $120,000 a year and still be eligible for the vouchers, is, is what the governor's proposal ultimately leads to. Uh, it would be an estimated cost of $178 million in one year, plus there would be annual increases. So in the governor's budget, they're proposing $159 million for public education, $178 million for vouchers to private education. So more public money in the first year of the budget would go towards private schools than to public schools. Um, the the real argument for me is, and I've always been of the, I've, I've, I've taken the position publicly that if money is going to follow students, it's hard for me to argue that. We, we have open enrollment. We get a lot of open enrollment students in. Truly, dollar for dollar, used to follow the kids with open enrollment. That's all kind of changed, and it's just in our foundation payments now, and it's, you know, that's fine. The money does follow the kid through open enrollment. 
However, we roughly receive uh, about $5,900, is that fair, yeah. Ms. Robertson, for each student. Under the governor's uh, plan for vouchers, students in grades 9 through 12 would receive $8,900 to, to follow them. Students in grades K through 8 would receive $6,900. The only thing I've ever asked is just give us the same amount of money. It, we currently receive $5,900 per student. Give me the $8,900 per student for kids in high school. Uh, if, if we're going to do this, then level the playing field. Uh, also, don't feel like we should be responsible for busing students to private schools any longer if the voucher programs go in as they're proposed. Those schools are now getting public funds. They can bus their own kids. Uh, so there, there are a lot of things that that I think we just need to level the playing field. In the House version, uh, and ironically, the governor's version in the budget bill is the most palpable version of voucher bills out there. In the House version, it would be universal vouchers for all students in Ohio. There is no requirement for poverty level. There's no requirement that you have to attend a public school because originally the vouchers were established that and this is key to remember, when vouchers first came about, private schools said that they could do it better than public schools and cheaper. That's why they, they argued for vouchers. Now, it'd be nice if we held them to that. I mean, why do they need $8,900 if they can do it cheaper? But they said they could do it cheaper. Uh, they said they could do it better than public schools. Data has showed public school students test far better than their private school counterparts, and it's now more expensive. Uh, but I digress. <laughs> the House version has universal vouchers for all students. Uh, previously, students had to show that their public school was a failing school, and that's how they could get the voucher to go to a better school. Now, there's none of that. It just They're just eligible immediately. Under the House version, it would cost estimated $1.13 billion in year one, and then annual increases from there. Remember, uh, we're getting 159 million. They're proposing 1.13 billion for the vouchers under the House plan. Uh, the Senate plan, again, universal vouchers. Uh, the the difference between the House and the Senate is uh, there there are there are no tax credits associated with the Senate plan. In the House plan, if you homeschool your child. Uh, you'd be eligible for a voucher, plus you get a tax credit for homeschooling. Uh, under the Senate plan, there was no tax credit, so the estimated cost to implement universal vouchers under the Senate plan is $536.4 million in year one, and then annual increases from there. Again, the, the money being dedicated to vouchers under the House or Senate plan could fully fund public schools. So the money is there. Uh, we're just choosing to allocate it in different ways. So three voucher bills out there, in some way, shape, or form, the voucher's are going to go through. It's just a matter of which plan uh, is adopted and, and taken under consideration. All three plans, the money for kids in grades 9 through 12 is $8,900. For uh, students in grades K through 8, $6,900. So uh, I... I you know, I, I expect that will stay consistent. Um, it's just a matter of how much money is going to be dedicated to the vouchers. House Bill 1 is the Income and Property Taxes Bill. Uh, this bill, as it currently sets up, I truly believe is, is dead in Columbus. Um, I, I do think we'll see some sort of income tax changes in the budget bill. I think it will just get transferred into the budget bill. I don't know that it will be the flat tax that was originally proposed, uh, but I believe there will be some sort of tax cut in regards to income tax in Ohio. Just don't know if it will be a flat tax or not. The property taxes are where things really got uh, interesting to say the least. Uh, there were a lot of unanticipated consequences to the provisions of House Bill 1 that would have altered how property taxes were uh, 
assessed and some rollbacks that they wanted to institute. Uh, there were some bills on, on record, uh, some provisions in the Ohio Constitution that also impacted this. And essentially what, what came to light is if House Bill 1 had passed as it was written, uh, there would have been about a $1 billion increase in property taxes to private properties. Uh, everyone's property taxes would have gone up, which was the exact opposite of what the intention of House Bill was, House Bill 1 was. So fully believe that piece of the bill is dead in the water. Um, uh, anytime you're looking at a $6 billion surplus and you have an unvoted on increase in property taxes of a billion dollars when you're already running that kind of surplus, it's just a political nightmare. So really believe that part will go away. Uh, again, I do look for some sort of income tax cut to happen, uh, but I, I kind of have a feeling it'll just get rolled over into the budget bill. So um, we'll keep an eye on that. Any question on those pieces of legislation? Ms. Robertson, what do you want to add? Yeah, a few just how this would affect us. So the first is the piece of the funding of whether it goes from 50, per, or we're currently at 33% of the increase to 50 to 66. We are, over the next five years, I actually have our state funding pretty much flat. Um, that piece of the budget actually does not affect us that much because we are so close to what is called the guarantee. Um, so depending on what percentage that is funded at, we kind of bounce on and off the guarantee, which means, I'm just going to completely make this easy, if we receive $10 million, we can't drop below $10 million, so they will supplement whatever the actual equation gets you, they'll supplement it to get you back to the $10 million. We are so close to that 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 percentage isn't affecting us that much. Now, while I still think that's good news, go forward, obviously, if they funded it 100%, because that just speeds it up then for you know, the next years, the bigger thing would be if we can get to the 2022 numbers versus 20, 2018. Mm -hmm. That would be the bigger win. Selfishly, for our district, that would be the bigger win. Um, but so far, right now, we don't, you know, I don't have our state funding swinging drastically at all. The other piece, the really, really good news, is the property tax. That is the piece that if that changed under the original, um, proposal that would have really hurt us um, so really good to hear that hopefully that piece of it will go away at least in how it was originally proposed um, and go from there and then the other piece for the income tax it's at the state level so um, depending on what that happens that would affect us but not as much as the property tax so I think the biggest win for us at this point is the fact that hopefully that property tax piece doesn't go forward um, that would be, that would hurt us a lot. So that's the piece that, happy to see it. Um, hopefully, hopefully it keeps moving in the direction we think it's going to move. I've heard the same thing in all my forecasting meetings. Um, we've heard the same thing. So um, hopefully that's the case. But um, I'll have more details in May when I go through everything. Hopefully we even have more information then. And I have some rough <coughs> estimates now. Um, but we'll officially be presenting. Any questions? All right. A couple other uh, just announcements of events coming up I want to make the board aware of. Friday, April 28th, this will be next week. Uh, really excited about this. Our middle school started uh, doing Real Money, Real World, I think two years ago. Um, or, and uh, it, it's we do it with our seventh grade group. Uh, and I know Ms. Hahn touched on it in her last principal update, few things have changed since she gave you an update. We now know that the uh, Ohio State Treasurer, uh, Mr. S Robert Sprague, will be here for that event. Uh, his team is going to come down help work the event. Uh, they're bringing the press with them. Uh, administration from Ohio State University will be here as well as they're helping organize and run the event. So it's all part of Financial Literacy Week and uh, we, we fully expect uh, a full house. Uh, it'll be at the Activity Center on the 28th. I'll get specific times 
the board members, if you want to stop by, would love to have you. I think they're going to get started in the morning. I want to say around 9 o'clock, but I'll, I'll get specifics to you. But we're really excited to have the treasurer of the state of Ohio here that day and his team and the uh, press coverage that will come with that. So that would be Friday, April 28th. I will actually be. I'll be actually be involved in it. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, just an incredible <laughs> event for our district, and uh, so we appreciate uh, Mr. Fump, Mr. Burke, uh, Ms. Hahn, Ms. Rice, uh, the team at the middle school that have kind of organized this and put it together, and then obviously uh, we're excited to have uh, those guests with us that day, and it should be a should be a great day for the seventh grade students as well as just our district in general. So, just want to get that on your radar. Then Sunday, April 30th, our inaugural alumni choral event will be at the held at the Robert Trochia Performing Arts Center over at the high school. That is start at 3 o'clock. Uh, so if you uh, are available that day, we'd love to have you. And then, uh, again, just putting it on the calendars, Monday, May 22nd, we'll have our state of schools in the Robert Trochia Performing Arts Center. That will start at 5.30. Uh, we've always kind of crunch that right up against the board meeting so we we're going to start the state of schools at 5 30 instead of 6 this year we push the board meeting from 7 to 7 30 so we have plenty of time there for uh, the state of schools and pictures for parents and those type of things then we'll transition out to the cafeteria for the board meeting. so uh, from now till the end of may it, it's a crazy time of year a lot of events happening but uh, we're certainly excited to be steamrolling towards graduation and all of the pomp and circumstance that happens with that. So, any questions on those updates? All right, all right, Ms. Roberts. All right, three things for this evening. Um, the first is we'll actually talk through more of this in the state of schools, um, but Mr. Belville and I have been talking and going through the numbers, and we are going to propose to waive student fees again for this coming school year. Um, the current school year that we're in is the first year that we um, – you know, that we kind of move forward with that. One of the reasons being that students and families have to start paying um, for lunches again. You know, it had been free lunches and free meals throughout COVID. Um, so then with this, it was one of the ways that we felt like we could kind of ease back into things and help with that. Um, it went really well this year. So we will be proposing to waive those fees again this year. So happy to, happy to start announcing that and more details to come around that um, during the state of schools. Um, the next thing, um, and actually I'm going to jump over this, but the next thing is uh, also during that May 22nd board meeting is when I will be officially kind of presenting the five-year forecast. So just as a heads up, I always do that the second board meeting in May. Um, so we'll present that and go through all the details. Um, I actually have it in a pretty good spot at this point, and I do not anticipate a lot of changes since November. So nothing that, you know, is drastic. We kind of come in here, I'll say it again. Tonight when we go through financial reports, but nothing that's drastically um, moved since November. But I'll officially present that in May. And then the last thing is that um, two weeks ago, so the, let's see, March 30th, um, we had about $13 million sitting in Benton County Bank in cash. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do was move some of that cash out um, for a few reasons. One, just from a safety standpoint, of there was a lot of cash sitting in one spot. Um, we were protected, you know, we're public funds, so we're protected, but at the same time, just to kind of diversify where we had cash sitting. The other is that with some of the investment markets coming back, um, about two years ago, we had moved all of our investments out of Star, Ohio, into longer-term investments, and when I say longer-term, it was five years and under, but longer-term investments with meter, and we've seen a lot of success with that. Um, the market within Star, Ohio has started to come back and actually has seen some really good returns. So of the $13 million, roughly $13 million with Minton County Bank, I moved $9 million of that into Star, Ohio. Um, the exciting thing is in one day, we saw uh, interest of almost $2,500. So it was double what we had been earning just you know, sitting um, in the bank. So I think it was, uh, it was a good first move. Obviously, that, that's a one day. So I mean, but still, it was exciting to go in and look at <laughs> one day we earned $2,500. Um, the nice thing about Star Ohio is that they are quick one day, for the most part, one day investments. So it's essentially can act like a bank account and that you can get your hands on cash quickly if you need to. Now, obviously, I've mapped it out and we have some um, 
June 1st debt payments and then December 1st debt payments that we have every year. Um, those are really our big payments that we need above and beyond just our daily operations. Um, so we've prepared for that. That's why I purposely left about $4 million sitting in Benton County Bank so we can make those June 1st payments. And then we actually have enough to go ahead and make the December payments, but we'll obviously wait till December. So um, I'll continue monitoring that. We can get our hands on it if we need it. But at this point, we have um, at Benton County Bank, we have a $2.5 million um, account that basically stays at $2.5 million and it, the money moves in and out of it nightly just to keep that right where it is. That's really the money that we use um, to run the daily operations of the district. Um, so that's really what we're going off of. So we have a little bit of a cushion of about $1.5 million sitting there. So more to come, um, but just it was a big move that we did. Um, so far, so good. So I'll continue to watch that after after a day, one day, one day investment <laughs> week. We saw positive results, so might as well talk about the positives when we see them. <laughs> um, that is all I have for tonight, unless there's any other questions. Me? All right, thank you. All right, we've been uh, number three, recognition of visitors. Anybody signed up? No? Okay. All right, we'll move into number four, uh, reports and presentations, 4.1. Mr. Destadio has a presentation on the Purple Star designations for Fairfield Union. Matt? Really appreciate the opportunity to address the board tonight. I uh, wanted to bring you uh, up to speed and kind of fill you in on some uh, amazing work that's been going on behind the scenes this year, uh, specifically at two of our buildings, uh, Fairfield Union High School and Rushville Middle School. Uh, it is my pleasure to announce this, uh, this evening that we were officially awarded the uh, Ohio Department of Education Purple Star Awards for the high school and the middle school. And these awards go out to uh, di districts and buildings who uh, make a conscious effort to support military families and students in their district. Uh, before I go into a little bit of the background, I'm sure you have a lot of questions as to what went into this process. Uh, I would like to thank a lot of the um, staff members who kind of behind the scenes did a lot of the work and typically don't get a lot of the credit. So uh, first off, I'd like to start off by thanking Deanna Throckmorton. Uh, one of the largest tasks uh, as we went through this application process uh, was we had to come up with a permanent page on the school website that was going to have uh, all of the resources in one location uh, that we had to put together to, to make this happen. Um, when I sat down with Deanna, as Deanna always does, she was able to take kind of the vision, uh, do a lot of the research, a lot of the gathering, uh, look around the state of Ohio to see what other school districts are doing, and after a long process of working together, uh, she put together an absolutely fantastic page on our website. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, it's actually on the Parents tab, and as you go to the Parents tab on the left-hand column, uh, on the very bottom of the left menu, uh, there is a tab that will say Military Supports and Services, um, and it is highly, highly thorough. And uh, really, she did an amazing job of taking all the information that we had to gather through this process and put it in one easy location uh, for the entire district to, to look at. So I would like to start off by thanking Deanna for all of her hard work behind the scenes. I'd like to also thank uh, Mr. McPhail and Trisha Hahn, uh, building principals at the high school and the middle school. Uh, when I sat down with them at the beginning of the school year, I said, hey, this is what I want to do. Uh, the list was long uh, of tasks that it was going to add to their, uh, to their job duties. And to their credit, uh, the only thing they said to me was, we don't care if we win the award. This is such a worthwhile adventure. We're going to do this to make sure we can support our kids in a way that we haven't done before. Um, in terms of organizing the information, communicating with the building personnel, working with BLTs, et cetera, et cetera, um, it was a flawless process. The communication was at certain points throughout the process uh, daily, trying to gather information, uh, plan with them, see what we already have in progress, what needed to be added. Uh, so I'd like to thank them for their building leadership. And then last but not least, I'd like to thank Kathy Poston and Brian Funk. Uh, that is the guidance counselors at the high school and middle school. Uh, one of the other criteria is we had to designate a point of contact person or a military liaison for this process. Um, in addition to all of their normal duties, uh, they, they volunteered and underwent an additional two to three hours of training um, to help kind of get this program in motion. So uh, I'd like to thank all of those individuals for all the hard work they did behind the scenes uh, to get this, this award for us here this evening. Uh, a little bit of background information for us. At the beginning of the school year, you know, we really felt that uh, we had a couple of buildings that were good candidates for the Purple Star Award. The Purple Star Award, uh, Ohio was actually the first state to adopt this program five years ago. And since that time, 30 other states have come on board. 
in the state of Ohio, over 400 school buildings have been awarded this uh, distinction, 163 this year, and we were two of those 163. So it's one of these things that is um, relatively new, but once we, once we heard about it, we started looking into the details. Um, knowing the history of our community, we thought this is something we wanted to pursue. So luckily, like I said, we were able to um, achieve those awards for two of our buildings. Um, a large portion of our community has, has vast military connections. So we felt this was a way that we can not only as a district say thank you uh, to our communities, but also provide a layer of support so we really never had the opportunity to do before. Um, one key disadvantage as you go through and look at the statistics for military families is the lack of consistency or being in one spot for a long time. Uh, when you look at the hierarchy of needs for children and what they need to learn, you know, they need to feel safe. And sometimes when you are moving from place to place, that can have a negative impact on a student, obviously, not their choice. Uh, they're going to be kind of at the mercy of their parents and where the military places them. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to do was try to pool our resources and figure out what could we do to put together a program so when we have military families and students in the district, we could, we could support them and help them maybe a little bit more than what they're used to having. So as part of our plan, uh, we put together resources for some new um, welcoming committees from kind of a social perspective. This is kind of geared more towards the middle school <laughs> age group. I think we all remember junior high. Uh, not too many people who have the fondest memories of junior high, but uh, one of the most important things we could do there was make sure that as students are moving into the district, uh, we wanted them to feel welcome. So we've worked with the student council groups to kind of put together a plan to welcome these students from a social perspective, get them you know, ingrained in the community, talk to them about the, uh, the different opportunities we have here from sports to after school clubs, et cetera, to make them feel welcome. Um, we also provided additional layers of academic supports and communication, hosting military recognition nights and events, and as well as linking with families uh, with additional resources to federal programs, uh, which you can once again find on that website, you know, just name a few. Uh, with that being said, we did submit the applications for the high school and the middle school back in the fall, so it's been quite the long waiting process. Um, and we feel very confident that moving forward uh, next year we're going to be uh, pursuing these awards for both elementary buildings as well. So we'll, we'll go ahead and start this summer working on uh, Pleasantville and Bremen Elementary, putting together a plan to, to make sure we can apply for this award. As we all know, we have a lot of great events and supports in those buildings. Uh, but we want to kind of take it slow. Um, for me personally, having some experience at the high school and kind of knowing some of the details there, we thought it would be a great opportunity to start this year with two of our buildings gather the feedback, see what the process looks like, and uh, now we're pretty confident that next year we'll be able to pursue two more, uh, two more awards as well. But we did receive the Purple Star Awards for the high school and middle school buildings. This is good. That's great. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any questions I could answer for you? No, I guess not. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Matt. All right, that moves into the consent agenda section 5.1 is uh, workshops and conferences. I think we got about four of them there. Uh, Would recommend we approve those as okay. presented. Okay. Anybody have any questions, comments on any of those? Okay. Uh, let's see. We'll move into 5.2 financial items then. All right, so we have three donations uh, that we would like to recognize this evening. The first is a donation of $500 from Mary, excuse me, Mary Downer for the football program. Second is a donation of $400 from Account Technologies, Inc. for the football program. And the third is a donation of $100 from Les Keys for the football program. So obviously very grateful for those, and I'm sure the football program will um, use that money uh, wisely and will definitely appreciate it. So thank you to those three don uh, donors. And then the last two things I have are March uh, financial and insurance report. So I'm going to start with our financial report. And I kind of alluded to this a second ago. I am a broken record every month. I come in and I do not have a lot of new information for us, which in the treasurer's world is good. That's good thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so far revenues for the total year have totaled $22,070,764 for the year compared to last March of about $21.6 million. So it's up 2.4%. Um, you can see the biggest swings so far are coming from property tax and income tax. Property taxes so far are up 10%. Income tax is up 17%. 
you can see straight for state grants, which is our state foundation payments, are up 3%, um, just about $250,000. And then other revenue, this is where um, our biggest swing is, but if you keep in mind, um, this is where tuition came in in the past and it's no longer coming in. It's just in a different line item. So while our total revenue looks like it's only up 2.4 and then you see property tax and income tax up so high, it's because it's being offset by the other revenue, which is the tuition payments. However, the good news is, is that within other revenue is where we also receive our interest. So interest as of March has surpassed the entire year last year. So we have received $328,000 in interest so far this year versus the total year last year of 144. So we still have three months to go and we're already, we've already doubled interest from last year. So mm. obviously the markets are coming back. Um, hopefully Star Ohio will then also continue to increase that and we'll continue to watch that. But happy to see that because that's something that for the last few years we really took a big hit in our interest payment. So happy to see that starting to come back. Um, expenditures. Our expenditures so far have been $18.7 million. Um, last year we were at $17 million. Um, personal services are our biggest increase. We were at $9.7 million versus $8.7. It's up 12%. Um, this is at 80% of our forecast versus through March, we should be at about 75% of our forecast. So it is trending slightly higher um, than I had anticipated, but I'll obviously look at that and revise some of that uh, for our May forecast. Um, benefits are up 4.5%. No major callouts. We're at $4 million versus 3.9. So no major callouts on that side. Um, purchase services are actually under last year. We're at 1.8 million versus almost 2 million last year. Um, however, keep in mind this year this is where uh, tuition is being paid out of. So it's kind of an opposite piece of it. Um, the other thing within purchase services is that we moved, um, we hired our BRT in district through the ESC. So we saw purchase services come down, but then our, our salaries go up. Yeah. Um, so just kind of a little bit of an offset. And then we did see an increase in supplies for the month. We are up 19%. Um, uh, $50,000 of that increase to last year is just an increase in fuel costs, um, which I had accounted for. Um, we revised that in November and actually increased it even more. We had anticipated fuel costs to come down, and at that point they just weren't. Um, at this point, we have spent $162,000 in fuel versus last year through March, we spent 116. dollars So just continuing to rise um, and to really look at that. So uh, we had a few other final payments of some things last month. Um, some of the, the wireless radio project, the bus monitors that we did, we had final payments last month. Um, we had a Spanish curriculum payment last month. So some of those big payments hit us last month, which is why we saw it a jump in, uh, in the month for expenditures. Um, overall though, um, we are sitting in a really good spot. Um, our cash balance, we're at $18.3 million compared to $17 million last March. The f I'm forecasting the year at 17 million. I don't think that'll change much um, come May. Um, I did look at it last year at the end of March through the end of June. We basically decreased about $2 million. So if we decrease from that $18 million by about $2 million, we would be at the um, 16 3 but I think we have some increased payments. So um, I actually think we're gonna come in right around that $17 million of where we're projecting. So overall, we're sitting in a good spot um, and just kind of monitoring things as they go. I am keeping my eye on that, um, the salary expense because it is trending slightly high. However, we did have three payments in the month of March because um, it's one of our months mm -hmm. that we have three pay. So that's where a little bit of it is swinging, but still that should be accounted for. Any questions on financial, financial piece? Okay, I will move into insurance. <clears throat> the first piece of, of insurance is for health insurance. Our revenue for the year is at just under $3.4 million versus $3.3 million last year. Um, we did have flat premiums this year to last year. However, our pharmacy rebates are kind of helping to swing those revenues. So we're receiving rebates this year. We've received 
just under $150,000 of rebates. Um, so that's where we're seeing that increase compared to revenues for last year. Our expenditures this year are very close to last year. We're at 2.793 versus 2.820. Um, that's a difference of like 1.5%. So very little difference in our expenditures. And our cash balance ended the month at $3 million compared to almost 2.2 last year. Um, so not a lot of movement in health insurance right now, which is good because um, you know insurance kind of has that roller coaster. So we are definitely prepared to kind of see the, the downside of things, but feeling good about where we're positioned at this point. Um, when we look at dental insurance, um, our revenue did decrease to last year. However, we planned that because we took our premiums from $94 down to 89. So we knew that we would see a decrease in revenue. Our expenditures have slightly increased. Um, they've increased by $10,000 or 7%. So I call that a win for, for overall dental insurance. And our cash balance is sitting at $230,000 compared to 224 dollars last year. So overall, we have a very healthy insurance program. Um, you know, in looking at, um, we're starting to prepare for what rates will be for next year. Um, so I will have all of that information over the next few weeks and in the next board meetings to get those approved by the board. Um, but looking good so far, so I think we're in a good spot. Any questions on insurance? It looks good. Okay. Um, that's it for financial items, and then I have the food, food report. report. Good. Is that okay. Yep. Okay. So our food service report. This is through the month of March. Um, and basically, if you look at our first column, it's uh, through March, and then the second column is year to date. So, so far for the year, we have served over 178,000 meals. We have brought in $738,000. Um, and then we are uh, spending $290,000 in food, about $22,000 in paper, which that's basically like any serving, napkins, utensils, all of that, uh, that type of items, for a total of $313,000. We have received $67,000 in rebates. Um, one of the things when we started working with Chartwells is that we obviously had to pay a per meal cost and then an overall like advisory fee to them. The one thing that they um, really came to us and said is that our rebates that you will get back that we weren't receiving in the past, those rebates would exceed the cost of what we are paying them. And that is basically true. The year-to-date Chartwells fees are um, about $38,000 and rebates are about $68,000. So we've seen $30,000 more in rebates than what we are paying out to Chartwells on the per meal fee and then the like an overall advisory fee. So really happy about that. Um, that was the one thing that we you know continually monitor. We will continue to receive rebates monthly um, for the next three months. So only expecting to see those rebates go up. Um, Overall, the one thing to call out is that if we were to just look at if we're, you know, we're either bringing in money or losing money for the year, we have actually lost $20,000 for the year, meaning we have spent $20,000 more than we have brought in. Our per meal cost is $4.25. Our revenue per meal is $4.13. So we're basically losing $0.12 cents every single meal, which is where that minus $20,000 is coming into play. That was obviously a major red flag for me. Um, you know, you never want to see, essentially our food service runs as a business. Um, you never want to see that. However, when I really worked with Chartwells and talked to them and said, okay, what are other districts seeing? Unfortunately, we are in line with other districts at this point. Um, I've actually talked to several district, districts that they are losing several hundred thousand dollars at this point for the year. So. Well, I never want to say losing $20,000 is good. I think we are in line. The one thing that the USDA is doing to offset that, since a lot of people are seeing that, is they are providing what is called supply chain assistance funds. And what that is is to help out with the cost of food and the cost of just getting food, so increased fuel costs and all of that. We received this last year. We received roughly $30,000 this year, and have received $52,000 this year. It's a one-time receipt that you'll get per year. So when you take that into account, we have actually, we're on the positive by $32,000. So 
So the purpose of that $52,000 is to offset the higher costs. The scary thing to me is at any point in time, those supply chain assistance funds, are they're not guaranteed. Um, you know, they're not something that we can say, okay, we're going to keep relying on that year after year and because it, we nobody knows if they will provide that again next year. So my concern is that if we're spending 425 and we're only getting in 14, 413, so we're losing 12 cents every meal, what can we do to make that um, cost either decrease or what can we do to make our revenue increase? So we have to offset it one way or the other. Um, at this point, that's what I am working with Chartwells on to kind of get a game plan for go forward. Um, when we look at it, we are in line with other public school districts. There's a measurement that they use, that Chartwells uses, as far as how many working hours do we have versus how many meals go out the door. So kind of efficiency. It measures efficiency. Um, both of our elementary schools are around 17 to 19 meals per hour. Like if you look at all the working hours that go into it, 17 to 19 meals. That's right on average for most elementary schools. So our elementary schools are efficiency levels really working at where efficiently where they should. Our middle school is a little bit less. Um, they're around 15 meals an hour. Um, there's a few more choices in that middle school. There's a few more preparation. They have a few more, um, you know, a few more choices. So that's typical to see that efficiency. I wouldn't even say, it. I'm maybe using the wrong word, but it's just meals per hour that go out the mm -hmm. door. Um, that is down to 15. Again, that's pretty average for all middle schools across the state of Ohio, or across the country, really, they were saying. The one where we're actually lower is in the high school. Our high school is only serving about 10 meals per working hour. Um, however, while the high school typically always sees the less because there's so many like stations, like there's a pizza station, a grab-and-go station, a salad station, um, that is very typical for most high schools. Um, we were a little bit on the lower end of what we needed to be. However, when looking at it, I think we are running at an efficient level of what we are doing. I think what we just need to continue doing now is saying, okay, how can we control new food <coughs> costs? Is there something else that we can look at doing? Um, how else can we look at those costs? Because if we're feeling like the number of meals that are going out the door are in line with average, what else can we do? So those are some of the things I'm working with Chartwells on. Um, it's hard for me to sit here and say we're in a good spot when we've only lost $20,000 because it's $20,000 that essentially we took from our, you know, our food service fund. We're still in a good, we're in a good spot um, in our food service fund, so I'm not necessarily concerned about them, but at the same time, I don't like walking in here saying we're losing money without that USDA reimbursement. So that's a lot of information. It's the first time we have looked at the food service area like this. It's the first time we've looked at per meals per hour. Um, this is our first gauge this year of what we are spending on meals versus what we are receiving on meals. Um, I know last year going into the school year we um, looked at our meal costs. Um, we hadn't increased those meal rates for a long time. Um, I think we're still on the low end compared to the schools around us. Um, we're at three dollars for a lunch right now which is still low compared to a lot of schools. Um, but that's where we sit today. So um, I think we are, we have a good recap at this point and now it's getting an action plan in place to say okay what can we do, how can we look at next year if we don't receive those supply chain assistance funds we're not going to depend on those so what can we do. If we get them, great, but we nobody knows if those are going to continue. So, so as we finish up this first year with Chartwell, mm -hmm. Other than the numbers here, how are things looking overall? Yeah, I think um, overall I'm feeling good. I actually had quite a few meetings with Chartwells over the last few last few weeks. Um, I think from a from what we've gathered from students, from what we've gathered about the time that students are standing in line, from the meals that are being served, the recipes, the quality of food, I think we're feeling really good. Um, we knew year one going into something new. We knew there was going to just be a learning curve. That's with any new contract, any new partner. Um, I think we've made it past that learning curve now at this point, and I think the kitchens are running really well. Um, I still feel good about it. Um, you know, I think that we're making some strides and things. Unfortunately, I, I, I hear them when we are saying, you know, that twenty-one thousand. 
it is true. All the districts I have talked to, a lot of people are seeing negatives. Um, so while it's not something I like, I think it's a true statement to say we're right in the thick of it with a lot of people. Um, so I appreciate those rebates because if we weren't getting those rebates, it'd be even it'd be worse than that. So, are, are those other schools also using Chartwell or are any of them? Some of them that? are. Some of them are using their own staff. A lot of people are seeing it's the food costs. Things that we used to see, like chicken patties, are one that we keep going back to, and chicken nuggets have like doubled in cost. And people are just aren't, I mean, we yeah. see it in our grocery yeah. store. You know, we just, I don't think anybody was, nobody's prepared for that. Nobody's prepared for cost to double. We are seeing, um, last year, we were really struggling just with the availability of food. We couldn't even get our hands on things. Right, right. And that was one of our main reasons was just, you know, Chartwells is a bigger ship. They have more contracts. They have more availability. And I think we have seen that that has provided to be beneficial to us, um, but the, even the costs to them are still going up. So to answer your question, yes, it's all over the board, not just people with chart wells. Um, I've talked to a few districts that have, have negatives of over $200,000. Now granted, they're bigger than us, so relatively. Um, so while I, I don't like that, I think it's a, it's a common theme right yeah. now. Have you compared the cost that we're charging we have. Mind, I mean, we're low. We're low. We're very low. Um, when we came up to three dollars, it brought us up to the low end of lunch charges. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm amazed that you can pay to get to three bucks. I mean, that's yeah. where I like. That's kind of what we were saying too. Is and even if you look at just the rebates that you get, and I have it in here, um, state lunch reimbursements, we are receiving anywhere from four dollars, four dollars to four forty one. So that tells you that if we can receive a reimbursement for a student who receives free lunch, we get a reimbursement of four forty one. A student who's received reduced lunch, we get a reimbursement of four dollars and more four oh one. A student who is paid, we still get a reimbursement of three eighty five. We're only charging I'm sorry, of eighty five cents. We're mm -hmm. only charging three dollars. So we're actually getting reimbursed. What that tells me is that the value of a cost of a meal is higher than the three dollars that we are charging right. um, so when we came up to that I think we were 265 before that I think so we went 265 to three dollars this for this school year when we came up to three dollars we are we're now in the realm of other schools but we are in the low end of other schools um, a lot of schools are anywhere from 350 to four dollars or right around us um, so Fairfield County and Franklin County, um, and then just the state of Ohio. So we're low. Um, that's one of our questions as well. Um, I am actually meeting, I have some upcoming meetings with Chartwells and meeting with them. Um, I'm meeting with them. Our next board meeting is May 8th. Eight. I have another in-house meeting with them on May 5th, and then um, some of our partners from Chartwells have offered that if, if anybody would like them to come to some board meetings and just talk about the food service industry and talk about you know K-12 and all that, they are more than happy to do that. Um, so I told them, you know, I put that out there. Um, I've kind of steered them away from that May 22nd board meeting just yeah. because there's yeah. a lot going on in that meeting. Yeah. Um, timing wise that seems to be <coughs> most sense but I've steered them away from that so potentially push them to the meeting in June um, instead just because I don't think it's a good idea to bring them here on May 22nd so good call but putting it out there we have some time to decide but they're definitely open to that if, if we would like them to you said the, the, the rebate the yeah so assistance for there that's a one-time deal is there any conversation that that could be back next year I mean we uh, there's no indication um, what we have started to see is some states at a state level have started to either go back or discuss going back to free meals the state of Minnesota just went back to completely free meals um, obviously there's a lot going on from a state level so before the reimbursements that we were getting was at a federal level 
So now states are starting to adopt that. I don't, I have heard nothing in the state of Ohio that that would be considered. Um, there's also implications to that of, you know, once things are free and then we don't have, it, it can, it can alter other areas of funding that you are getting. Our Title I funding is based on free and reduced lunch. And if people right. aren't filling those out because everything is free, then that funding comes down. So, it, you know, while yes, that, that helps, there's also there's the counter side of that that um, we can see other funding. So, now, we will stick, one piece of the, we will still continue to see rebates from food rebates. We'll always receive those with Chartwells. We just wouldn't see that USDA rebate. I'm just looking at rather than us raising right. costs to our students, right. if we've got the assistance available, let's use it while we have it. But right. worst case scenario, I mean, we're not trying to make money on food. Right. We're just trying to break even. So worst case scenario, we have to raise the price of lunches up 12 cents just, just to break even and right. be satisfied. Right. That's exactly it. You're right. The 12 cents, we would break even from our cost. Um, but yes, that's the same thing too. Is that's why we were kind of saying, okay, if we can't control food costs, if if that is somewhat out of our control, what can we do in house? Like, how can we be more efficient? What can we do um, to help the cost of things so that we can we can try to help control that four dollars and twenty five cents? Um, so we're coming up with it. We're coming up with a strategy. Um, I'm having more and more meetings with Chartwells, so I think. They know where our head is. They know what needs to happen for next year. Um, and I, I think that we're on the same page with, with things, and I think that they feel good. I think we feel good about the partnership. I think we feel good that, sure, there's going to be some, there's a learning curve to a new business. Like, that's part of it. We all yeah. knew that, and I think we feel good that we've made it through that learning curve, and I think that, you know, we're on the other side of things um, and have some good plans in place, so. Um, you know, I think, I think we're getting there. Um, I think now that we have some good, solid information on numbers, it's helping <coughs> guide us. Yeah. So we needed that. We needed, we needed that information to really be able to see what was going on, kind of underneath the top line numbers. So. Um, okay. Okay. Anybody else? All right. I'll move us into, uh, need a motion to approve the consent agenda section. So moved. Moved by Ms. Conrad Zang. Maestro, need a second? I will second. Mrs. Roberts? All right. Sorry. Let me catch up one second. Um, okay. Mrs. Conrad Zang, Maestro? Yeah. Mr. Smeltzer? Yes. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mrs. Johns? Yes. Motion's approved. That moves us into six, new business section. And uh, before I start, I'll just say that Whenever we get to your part and we're all done with it, you feel free to leave or you can stay. It's up to you. So. All right, 6.1 is a motion to approve the resignation for retirement for Barbara Roberts McKinnon as Rushville art teacher effective at the end of this school year. Um, very, very bittersweet. Uh, Bobby, uh, when, we, when we made the move to bring art back at the K through four level and have a full-time art teacher at the middle school. When Miss McKinnon first came on board, she was split between buildings and um, she really aided us in that transition. Uh, she mentored our new elementary art teachers. Uh, she welcomed them into her classroom, gave them suggestions, helpful hints, shared lesson plans. Uh, went and spent time with them in their classrooms to show them how to use materials. I mean, just went above and beyond. And uh, her passion for the arts, for our students, for this district has been unparalleled while she's been here. Uh, it has been an absolute pleasure uh, to work with her. Uh, we, are, we are truly losing a good person, a great soul, and uh, just a someone who has completely immersed herself in all things Fairfield Union since she's been here. And uh, uh, I'm incredibly grateful for all that you've done for my kids and all the other kids here. And uh, it is with a heavy heart that I would recommend we accept uh, her resignation for retirement on a 
on a personal level so happy for you and you get to that point in your career you get to enjoy other things but professionally uh, we, we've got some awful big shoes to fill and that's going to be difficult but Miss McKinney anything you'd like to say? Well first of all it's, it's just been like a dream come true being here you know I was in the retail and in the car business for 20 years and finally I got a chance to teach and I was like yes and then I go to Thank you very much, Ms. Kenneth. Ms. Kenneth. All right. Don't, don't sit down. Yeah, just hang on a second. I uh, need a motion to approve her resignation. So moved. Moved by Mrs. Johns. Any second? Second. Second by Mrs. Conrad Zangmeister. Mrs. Roberts. Mrs. Johns. Yes. Mrs. Conrad Zangmeister. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Smelter. Yes. Motion's approved. Thank you. All right, we'll move to 6.2. This is a uh, motion to approve. Nope, come on. Sorry, my computer's behind. There we go. Uh, we're talking about an amended uh, salary schedule and rates for 23-24. Mr. Belleville? I'll let Ms. Swerve I'll take that out. Yeah, this is actually, um, so we had approved our salary schedules um, a little early this year. So we just have a few updates to this, um, a few things that, um, as we've gotten closer to next school year that we felt that we needed to update. So if you go through the salary schedules, I have highlighted any changes that we made since the last update in yellow. Um, so I'm more than happy to answer any questions, um, but just a few changes listed. <coughs> Anybody have any questions, thoughts? Okay. All right, I need a motion to approve these uh, amended salary schedule. Moved by Mr. Hoffman. I will second. Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mrs. Conrad Zangmeister. Yes. Mrs. Johns. Yes. Motion's approved. 6.3. My computer is really slow tonight. I apologize. Come on. There we go. Uh, motion to approve a one-year teacher contract for Carrie Burnworth as elementary music teacher beginning 23-24 school year. Uh, as, as we say goodbye to one staff member, it is equally uh, emotional, uh, on, but at this point, extremely exciting uh, to say welcome home to another. Uh, Carrie uh, is just an incredible educator, uh, first and foremost, uh, so we're, we're bringing someone on board who is without a doubt going to elevate our, our music department, uh, the arts in general, and uh, but on top of just being an extraordinary uh, music educator, she's an even better person. Uh, from the work she's done with our musicals over the years, our band over the years, um, we, we could not be more blessed and lucky to, to have someone of her caliber join our faculty. Uh, it's extremely exciting. 
to know that uh, you know we we had a vision several years ago that we wanted to get uh, the arts back to a certain level here at the district. Uh, we we set forth with the plan. Um, we we have executed that as well as we could over the past several years, and this kind of feels like just an additional piece of the puzzle. Um, you know, the uh, it's exciting. It, you know, if, if you look over my left shoulder, uh, <laughs> you know, three we have, amigos. We have Mr. Savage <laughs> and uh, Mr. Kitchen and Mr. Gregory, and and to have them here to welcome Carrie just shows. Uh, the passion, the energy, the camaraderie in that in that department, and and ultimately that teamwork is what will propel us where we really want to go as a school district, and most certainly as a department. So it's uh, it's exciting to see that teamwork already established, and and the support that they have for each other, and and everyone kind of you know, taking on a, a role in the process, and and really pouring their hearts and souls into it. And I, our, our kids are, are, are reaping the rewards of that. Exactly. I mean, you, you sit and watch any, anything happening with our music department and the arts, and, and it, it's just incredible to watch right now. And it's exciting, and, and uh, it uh, gives me chills to think about and talk about. And, and certainly, Carrie is going to be a huge piece of that in laying that foundation <coughs> Uh, kids in their earliest stages are, are learning the basics and, and learning a love and passion for the arts and music so that when they get to the middle school and high school, you know, we're really elevating at that point as well. So, uh, Carrie, anything you'd like to say? Well, thank you so much for your kind words. I am very grateful for this opportunity to return home um, on a personal level for our boys to grow up in such a strong and wonderful community. Okay. Um, I'm very eager to get started with the students and with this awesome team of music <laughs> educators and to tradition the or to continue the tradition of excellence here. So, thank you for this opportunity. I mean, nothing like bringing her in saying, "Hey, take care of these guys." <laughs> well, that's I was going to say something about the yeah. <laughs> God bless you. So we'll there you go. Yeah. Yes. Anybody else have anything to say? All right. All right. All right. Let's do this. I need a motion to approve. So moved. Moved by Ms. Johns. Need a second? Second. Second by Mr. Hoffman. Mrs. Roberts? Mrs. Johns? Yes. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mrs. Conrad Zangmeister? Yes. Mr. Smelter? Yes. Motion's approved. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. See you. All right. Move to 6.4. I don't know what's going on tonight, Evan. Here we go. Maybe. Okay. Motion to approve a one-year support. Yeah, support service contract. For Mark Bennington, Jeff Dixon, and Paul Roberts as school building security officers. We, uh, I, you know, there are times you make decisions uh, that you think are good decisions at the time, and, and they turn out to be great decisions. Uh, I think the board's decision to add resource officers at all four buildings uh, might turn out to be one of the greatest decisions we've ever made. Uh, Having the peace of mind that we we have uh, sheriff deputies in all four buildings, uh, not just for the safety aspect of it, but when you go to our schools and see the interactions of our resource officers with our students, it is amazing. Uh, all three of these guys, along with Deputy Fiesel, uh, are truly interactive with our student body. Uh, they. You know, they're sitting at lunch tables with them. They're out on the playground at the elementary schools with them. 
they're walking kids to class, they, you know, the kid's having a bad day, they're sitting down one-on-one -on -one and talking with the kid and really trying to build those relationships. And it, it's magical to watch. Um, uh, we're now seeing many schools around us trying to copy <laughs> our, our uh, blueprint for putting uh, officers in, in buildings. Uh, but the one thing that, that isn't going to be able to be replicated, all of our school security officers are SROs. They've all worked in schools their, their entire careers. Um, and uh, that, that's just something you can't replace. Having that knowledge of how schools work, <coughs> how to interact with students and build those relationships is priceless. And uh, these guys have just done an incredible job. Uh, and uh, it, it's exciting to have them back next year. I'm, I'm glad they're willing to continue to come back. And we're certainly uh, overjoyed to have them. So would recommend them. I was going to sort of say the same thing, just even seeing the local news yeah. and them talking about how schools are looking at resource officers, and I'm thinking, you know what, we're already ahead of you. <laughs> it, it, it is definitely uh, a, a peace of mind, uh, there is no doubt. And like I said, at the elementary levels, uh, Deputy <coughs> Dixon and Deputy Roberts are just as much jungle gems as they are resource officers. I mean, <laughs> they're out on the playground with those kids, and uh, it, I mean, it, it's... It's amazing to watch on a daily basis. That might be interesting. And no, we'll, we'll never know, but the impact they're having as being in the buildings like that, like you mentioned, we looked at it from a safety standpoint, but I think we're gaining more value from it than we ever anticipated, yeah. and that's going to be impactful. Yeah, that, that's a great point, um, Ms. Kaufman. And, uh, you know, at, at the secondary level, it's now state law, we have to incorporate into our classrooms how to interact with peace officers. We're doing that in preschool. Uh, those kids will grow up through school having daily interactions with a police officer, and by the time they get to high school, you know, they'll, they'll look at those lessons like, why are we doing this? I mean, you know, we really like these guys. So, I mean, it, it truly the societal benefits, who knows? I mean, you, you really don't know. That's great. All right, I need a motion to approve. So moved. Moved by Ms. Conrad Zangmeister. I will second. Mrs. Roberts? Mrs. Conrad Zangmeister. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer? Yes. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mrs. Johns? Yes. All right, 6.5, substitute classified list. Uh, everybody checks that out. I think there's a couple names there. Okay, yep. All right, and if there's no questions, comments, I will uh, take a motion to approve. Moved by Mr. Hoffman. You get a second? I'll second. Second by Ms. Conrad Zangmeister. Ms. Roberts. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mrs. Conrad Zangmeister. Yes. Mrs. Johns. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Motion passes. 6.6 .6 is a supplemental personnel service contract for the school year 23-24. Lots of names there. Um, any questions, comments? If not, need a motion to approve. So moved. Move by Ms. Conrad Zangmeister. I will second. Mrs. Roberts. Mrs. Conrad Zangmeister. Yes. Mr. Smelter. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mrs. Johns. Yes. Motion's approved. 6.7. A, another supplemental personal con service contract uh, for Rob Myers as head cost country coach. Um, don't believe there's probably any. Okay, we just tried to separate that out. Uh, Mr. Myers would need to abstain if he was here. Tonight. Yeah, okay. All right. Need a motion to approve? So moved. Need a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Johns. Mrs. Roberts. Mrs. Conrad Zangmeister. Yes. Mrs. Johns. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Motion is approved. 6.9 is a list of uh, volunteers. 6.8. Oops. 6.8. Oh, goodness. Sorry, guys. This thing is just uh, messing with me tonight here. I have reboot because some of the accounts Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. So 6.8 is the supplemental for um, Mr. Johns for uh, the middle school football coach. 
thoughts, discussion? All right, need a motion to approve. Moved by Mr. Hoffman, seconded by Ms. Conrad Zangmeister. Mr. Roberts? Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mrs. Conrad Zangmeister? Yes. Mr. Smeltzer? Yes. Mrs. Roberts? Motion's approved. Uh, now, 6.9. Uh, with uh, more volunteers as presented. It's good to see that we have a lot of volunteers for our uh, upcoming fall season. Um, if no discussion, questions, I need a motion to approve. So moved. Ms. Conrad Zangmeister, I will second. Mr. Roberts. Mrs. Conrad Zangmeister. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mrs. Johns. Yes. Okay, 6.10 is uh, another volunteer uh, for Chad Myers as volunteer assistant cross country coach. And the same thing as the other Myers, we uh, separated him out because of Mr. Board Member Myers. Need a motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Ms. Johns. Need a second? Second. Second by Ms. Conrad Zangmeister. Mrs. Roberts. Mrs. Johns. Yes. Mrs. Conrad Zangmeister. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes, motion's approved. 6.11. Uh, this is a supplemental personal service contract as presented for Mr. Andy Clark for his transition uh, to the new athletic director from August 1st to August 17th. Right? Uh, Scott Harris will start August 1st as the athletic director. Right. And Kind of to help with that transition from Andy to Scott Harris from August 1st to August uh, 17th when school will start for Andy. We've asked Andy to kind of pull double duty as football coach and help with that AD transition, showing Scott you know, different programs that he uses, Arbiter, those type of things, facilities, and just be as a resource for Scott as he kind of learns the rules, so uh, just compensating Andy for that extra time. Okay. His contract ends as AD July 31st. Okay. So that, that's why we're asking him to do some extra time. Gotcha. Okay. Um, questions, comments? Not? Need a motion to approve? approve. Mr. Hoffman, I need a second. Second. Second by Ms. Conrad Zangmeister. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mrs. Conrad Zangmeister. Yes. Mrs. Johns. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes, motion passes. 6.12 is a motion to approve Travis Schaefer to take the boys' basketball team to Ohio University team camp June 9th through 11th. Yeah, this is a normal, normal summer camp. Okay. Questions, comments? If not, need a motion to approve? So moved. Approved by Mrs. Johns. I will second Mrs. Roberts. Mrs. Johns. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mrs. Conrad Zangmeister. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Motion passes. Uh, I just about skipped that one. Uh, 6.13, motion to approve Judd Baker to take the outdoor power team to Ohio State University ATI for state competition pending the team qualifies. Mr. Baker has several teams that have qualified for state at this point. Uh, we're going to effort to get all of them to a board meeting to recognize them and Mr. Baker for the hard work that they put into their competitions. I do believe the team qualified, uh, so uh, they uh, uh, had qualification last week, but we want to get this on the agenda just in case we have no results. So uh, excited for them and uh, certainly proud of Mr. Baker and all he Need a motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Ms. Conrad Zangmeister. Need a second? second? Second by Mr. Hoffman. Mr. Roberts? Mrs. Conrad Zangmeister. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mrs. Johns. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Motion approved. 6.14. Motion approved Jared Redding to take the boys' soccer team to an overnight team camp at a high Dominican University July 17th and 19th. I think this is a usual trip also. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Need a motion to approve? Moved by Ms. Johns. I will second. Mrs. Roberts. Mrs. Johns. Yes. Mr. Smelter. Yes. Mrs. Conrad Zangmeister. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Motion's approved. 6.15. This is the third reading of the handbook revisions. 
Um, if everybody's been able to look through those the last couple meetings, if there's any questions, comments. Okay. Need a motion to approve. Moved by Mr. Hoffman. Need a second. Second by Mrs. Johns, Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mrs. Johns. Yes. Mrs. Conrad Zangmeister. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Motion's approved. 6.16. Motion to approve revisions to the vision and mission statement as presented. This is a second reading. Questions? Okay. Um, need a motion to approve? So moved. by Ms. Conrad Zangmeister. Need a second? Actually, I will second. Mrs. Roberts. Mrs. Conrad Zangmeister. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mrs. Johns. Yes. 6.17, motion's approved. Uh, 6.17, motion to approve the renewal and rates for BWC services with Cedric beginning contract year September 1st, 2023. Um, so this is our yearly renewal that we do. Sedgwick is our third party provider for our workers comp um, service. Um, so this is just our yearly renewal. Um, fees for last year, um, actually I should say compared to last year, we have increased. Um, however, it looks like all of the companies within Sedgwick have increased. So we've gone up, our premium has gone up about $7,000. Um, we, last year our premium was, oh, I just lost it. Our premium was $37,000. This year we're at $45,000. The same thing for the group discount within Sedgwick went from 27 to 35. So seeing very similar increases. Um, we've had somewhat of an active few years within workers comp. Um, so seeing these go up, um, not surprised to see it go up, but it looks like we're going up at the same rate as the group. So, so we internally have had. Yes. We've had some ongoing cases that have been multi-year cases that have yeah, it hangs with us for like four years I think it does um, it's f like a five-year active rate based on there's a bunch of different factors yeah, that play into it but it, exactly it's crazy but exactly yeah so was there a discount offer last year or something like that? I thought workers comp workers comp over the past few years has actually provided um, I don't know if it would call them rebates but they send checks out um, and we've been getting a, quite a bit of money that they basically send out. Um, it's one of those things that within all of workers' comp, their total um, revenue and their total cash balance has been pretty high. So in order to help offset some things, they have sent checks out. Um, I don't know. I don't think that's continuing at this point. Well, no, it's never. So, well, and at this point, it's interesting that they've sent those out, and now this is the first time in a while that we are all seeing these increases. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> so, yes. Okay. Any other questions, comments? If not, need a motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Ms. Johns. Need a second? Second, second by Mr. Hoffman. Ms. Roberts. Mrs. Johns. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mrs. Conrad Zangmeister. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Motion's approved. 6.18. Uh, motion to re approve the resignation of Trisha Hahn from her current administrative contract effective July 31st. Before everyone has a heart attack. <laughs> I'll uh, Already talk did. about 6.18 and 6.19 together. Yeah. Ms. Hahn had approached me. Uh, the middle school principal position has been a 260 day position, 12 month position. Uh, she uh, had presented a plan to me that uh, she felt that the middle school principal could go down to an 11 month position like the elementary principals uh, between the work that she and Mrs. Rice do. Um, she just felt like uh, having set vacation days in the summer as opposed to using vacation days throughout the year would be more beneficial to the district, to the building, and for her personal schedule. Um, so Ms. Roberts and I talked about that. We looked at the plan Mrs. Hahn had presented and it made sense that we would not see a drop in uh, performance at the middle school. Um, they, they pretty much have the year ready to go. Uh, 
and get fired up by the middle of June, and then you know when start of August rolls around, it's pretty much just everything's ready to go. Uh, so our, her plan made sense. Uh, it does save the district a little bit of money, um, and uh, I don't think the building will see any change in in procedure. And then for Miss Hahn, that schedule worked better for her uh, as well. So it was kind of, uh, you know, benefited everybody all the way around. So in order to change her contract from its current 260-day contract to go down to the 242 days, we needed her to resign the current contract. We adjusted the salary schedule book accordingly. That was approved earlier in the board meeting, and now we need to reissue her a contract under the new Oof. the new guidelines as opposed to the 12 month calendar she had been working on. So what is that time frame she will have off then? Does it encompass like the two weeks of dark time that everybody has? It, or? Yeah, it, it, she, they go the, uh, I want to say the first two weeks of June and then come back like the last week of July somewhere, so there's like a month Mm -hmm. It's kind of it. Two of the four weeks that she'd be off for the dead period, mm -hmm. uh, and then like a week on either side of that. So, uh, Miss Roberts is pulling it up, but just makes sense that it, it would it just encompass like two sense weeks that, that everything's already uh, stopped. And <laughs> and generally, outside of the dead period, one of those weeks we asked the administrators to work from home because the custodians were shampooing carpets, yeah. stripping wax in the office. So. In all actuality, it really kind of lined up with what we were in practice doing anyway. Mm -hmm. And essentially, of course, the vacation days during that time frame versus right. her taking through the year when we kind of yes. rather have her. Yeah. No, yeah. 100%. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. It's like the two weeks of Christmas, those positions are off. So, you know, there's not a whole lot going on right then. So we really weren't getting a lot of bang for our buck having the principals in at that time, so they would take a lot of vacation, or you know, Mrs. Hahn's taking some vacation here in May because she has to use it or lose it. And so it, it really, we really were having vacation at inopportune times for the building. This kind of lays it out, the vacation's happening at this time, and, and uh, like I said, work for her schedule, it, it, it works for us. So it's so. 260 days down to what? Forty-two. Two. It eliminates her vacation days uh, because those are now set in the Okay. Any other questions, comments? All right. First, we'll deal with six point one eight. The uh, resignation. I need a motion to approve. So moved. Mrs. Johns moved. I will second. Mr. Roberts. Mrs. Johns. Yes. Mr. Smelter. Yes. Mrs. Conrad Zangmeister. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Motion's approved. And then the 6.19 is for uh, Mrs. Hahn for a three year administrative contract as Rushfield Middle School principal and um, beginning August 1st. Need a motion to approve that. So moved. Moved by Ms. Conrad Zangmeister. Need a second. Second. Second by Mr. Hoffman. Ms. Roberts. Mrs. Conrad Zangmeister. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mrs. Johns. Yes. Mr. Smelter. Yes. Motion's approved. Okay. That's all for new business. Moves to send to seven executive session. Uh, we will be going to executive session, but I do not believe there's any. No action taken. No action taken. Um, all right. Need a motion to adjourn to the executive session? Moved by Ms. Conrad Zangmeister. I will second. Ms. Rhodes. Uh, sorry, I'm flipping pages. Mrs. Conrad Zangmeister. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mrs. Johns. Yes. Motion's approved. We are in executive session at 829.